we need to have an eternal perspective. And I think that's something that the church has lost. The scripture says in the last days, many will be offended. There'll be great tribulation. Many people's hearts will grow cold. The love of God will grow cold because of lawlessness. And so what ends up happening is that the church has lost its eternal perception because they're so temporally fixed. And we're going to read. I want you to see something. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So there is a suffering of this present time. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So, there is a suffering of the present time. There is a terrible suffering of this present age. But the wonderful hope is that these sufferings of the present time are not worthy. They're not even close compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. And what is that glory to be revealed? It's the consummation of the age. It's the, it's the coming of the Messiah. And that's the bigger picture. And so many times we want um, a solution right now. So many times we want things right now. And yes, we need to pray for things right now. But also, at the same time, we need to have an eternal perspective. And I think that's something that the church has lost. Especially in America. Because we don't see the sufferings. We're sheltered. But we need to have an eternal perspective. Yes, we pray for things now. Yes, we pray for deliverance and healing and salvation and protection. We, yes, we pray for all of that. Absolutely no one is saying not to. We need to. But at the same time, we also have to have eternity stamped on our eyelids. This world is going to come and go. One day, you're going to take your last breath. One day, we will all see him. And I really believe that that needs to be recovered more than ever before, especially in these last days. We need to have an eternal perspective because if we don't, what will happen is that our hearts will grow weary and hardened because we have no, we only see the vision ahead of us, in front of us. We don't see the full picture. You see what I'm saying? And so we see all of the suffering. We see all of the evil. We see all of this horridness. And then our hearts get offended. The scripture says in the last days, many will be offended. There'll be great tribulation. Many people's hearts will grow cold. The love of God will grow cold because of lawlessness. Because of evil, men's hearts will grow cold. That's a two-way street. It grows, it, go, it grows cold because of the evil that people commit, but also it grows cold because of the evils that we see. The Bible says the love of many will grow cold. The word love there is the Greek word agape, and it means the love of God. 
And it's, it's, it's fair to say that the love of many that Jesus refers to are Christian people, believing people. The only uh, word that, aga- that that love is mentioned, agape, this word agape is, is the love of God. And the love of God is only shed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so what ends up happening is because of the evil that we see, because of the suffering of this world, do not be offended and do not, do not allow your heart to grow cold. And the way to remedy that is to, is to stamp eternity on your eyes. The way to remedy that is to recover the fullness of the expectation of salvation. This world is not our home. We are but pilgrims, sojourners in this world. And so what ends up happening is that the church has lost its eternal perception because they're so temporally fixed. And the scripture says, we've got to have an eternal perspective. You'll be surprised when you study the word, how much revelation is given as it relates to eternity. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Immediately, Paul understood this reality, the eternal reality. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. What is 70, 80, 90 years in your life? compared to the vastness of eternity after. We focus so much on this side of life. What about the endless eternity that awaits us? We've got to have a revelation on that. We've got to recover the eternal hope and see there are three things that remain in heaven forever. Faith, hope, love. Hope is not, I hope something happens. I'm crossing my fingers. I I'm wishfully thinking that's not, that's not hope. That's worldly hope. True biblical hope is a confident expectation of what is to come. That is real spiritual hope. Faith, hope, love. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things seen. Faith to believe things now. There is an element of that in the Christian life. And there's also an element of hope, the confident expectation of things that are coming. Hope will pull you into the expectation. This world is not your home. The trials and the temptations and the sufferings of this world are but temporary. There is a greater reality that is running parallel to this physical dimension. It's the kingdom of God. Look at what verse 19 says. The earnest expectation. The earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. What does this mean? 
that the 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 creation itself i want to just for a moment think of, about this in etern- in eternal perspectives the entire creation all of creation is eagerly earnestly in expectation the whole creation everything that exists heaven earth the universe the cosmos all of creation is in earnest expectation the earth itself creation itself is expecting expecting what eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of god now what on earth does that mean that's you and i that when we receive the messiah when we receive Jesus, we become a new creation. We are now sons and daughters of the Most High God. And so the earnest expectation of the creation is eagerly waiting for your revelation of sonship. Oh, that sounds self-centered. No, it's biblically centered. I'm giving you scripture. The earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Why? It's talking about the eternal redemption. That's that's what the that's what the expectation is. The earth is travailing for the manifestations of the sons of God, the revealing. What does that mean? Those who come to Messiah Jesus are now part of a new creation. And there is a fullness of redemption and eternity where we will, death will be swallowed up and we will have a new glorified body being sons of God. And this is what the earth is in expectation of. This is what Jesus came to accomplish, the forgiveness of sins and a new creation, the old passing away and the new coming to the newness of life. Yes, we've received the Holy Spirit as a deposit, as a down payment of our salvation, but the salvation will fully be accomplished when these dead bodies put on eternal bodies. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. The creation itself will enter into deliverance. When? It will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. It will be, in other words, the creation itself will be delivered out of the domain of corruption and darkness and bondage and into the liberty of the new creation. This is is what is going to be accomplished. It's not just die and go to heaven. It's no, it's there's a resurrection. There's a new life. There is a resurrection new creation. There's a deliverance of all things of creation a release of bondage of corruption the things that we see in this world are nothing but corruptions the sufferings of this age are nothing but corruptions look at what verse 22 says for we know that the whole creation groans and labors 
with birth pangs together until now. The whole creation is groaning. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. We ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for what? The adoption. What does that mean? He tells you the redemption of our body. What is that? The resurrection. For we were saved in this hope, this confident expectation. It's not just, oh, I received Jesus, I'm going to heaven. No, it's beyond that. It's beyond even what you think. It is, it is to be present with the Lord and to have a resurrection and to enter into the newness of life. Now we have a deposit of it. Now we have a foretaste of it, but we're not walking in the fullness of that just yet. But we will. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. He's what, what are we waiting for? The fullness of our adoption as the sons of God. The fullness of the death of corruption and to, and to bring into everlasting life the glorious resurrection. When was the last time you heard preaching on the resurrection? You don't see it often preached. Look at what verse 26 says. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession For us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Spirit of God inside of you groans for you, prays for you. It seems kind of funny that God is praying for you. Yes, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, is praying for you. So rejoice when you don't know how to pray for what to pray for. That's okay. We don't know what we should pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And this is why we must cling to the Spirit because He prays through us and for us. Now, He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit is making intercession for you according to the will of God. Isn't that amazing? God has a will for your life, but the only way that is accomplished is if the Spirit intercedes for on your behalf. Prayer is the currency of the activity of God. Prayer is the actions in which he is released to do his will. This is why prayer is so important. And he is praying for you. He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. If prayer is not important, and if there is no need for prayer, then why does the Holy Spirit himself pray for you? The Holy Spirit is making intercession for you. Not only that, the Bible says that Jesus has entered into intercession. Jesus is praying for you. 
the Holy Spirit is praying for you. How can that be? Because God himself is a praying God. Now that sounds kind of wild and it sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, look, he is a making intercession. He is praying. This shows us something in the Lord that his will and his activities are only accomplished through the vehicle of intercession. This is why prayer is so important. Nothing gets accomplished in God without prayer. Nothing gets accomplished in God without intercession. If God just willy-nilly snapped his fingers and made things happen, it doesn't you some people think that's the way he works and he doesn't. He doesn't work this way. He works according to the intercession of the Spirit and according to the intercession of the Son. Jesus is making intercession on our behalf, and the Holy Spirit is making intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Everything that he does is through intercession. Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who are in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why would Jesus tell us to pray this prayer? Nothing gets accomplished without intercession. Jesus was a praying Messiah on the earth. Jesus prayed. The, the, the source of his strength and the source of him releasing God's perfect will was through prayer. If Jesus prayed, shouldn't we? If the Holy Spirit intercedes, shouldn't we? We must be a praying people. And look at what verse 28 says. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Why? Because of verse 27. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So if you love God, if you are called according to his purpose, which is your salvation, every person who is a believer is called according to his purpose. We think we limit callings to just preaching. We limit callings to just ministry. We limit callings just to taking a microphone and laying hands on people. There's nothing wrong with that. And I believe in that. I myself am a pastor and an evangelist. But that's not, that's a very small portion of ministry. The great, the great calling is the salvation of your soul. Do you love God? Are you called according to his purpose? What does that mean? Are you called according to his salvation? Have you been called by Jesus to serve him? Then 
we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. So rejoice. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, what does that mean? He knew you before you were. I mean, this is, we're talking about eternity here. It reminds me of Jeremiah 1. It says, before you were in the womb, I knew you. And I've set you apart to be a prophet to the nations. God knew Jeremiah before Jeremiah knew Jeremiah. God knew Jeremiah before he was even formed in the womb. And God foreknew you before you were even a blip on the radar of human existence. And not only did he foreknow you, he also predestined you. He predetermined you to be conformed to the image of his son. What did he predestine us for? To be conformed to the image of his son. The predetermined purpose was to form you in accordance to Jesus' image. So he knew you before you were. He predestined you. He predetermined you to be conformed to the image of Jesus. That, that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. What brethren? You and I. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Not only did he foreknew you before you were born, not only did he predestine you to be destined to look like Jesus, but he also called you, called you to himself. So we see here that there is a calling to himself, a calling of salvation. And not only did he call you, he also justified you. He declared you righteous. You are now in right standing with God. He has now made you just because of Jesus. And not only did he justify you, these he also glorified. There is a glory of there there is a glory that is coming. There is a glorification. So you're predestined, you are called, you are justified, you are glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? God is for us. Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The, 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 listen, the, the, the hardest thing that Jesus had, that, that the father had to give was his son. And if he freely gave us his son, shall not he freely give us all things? That was the hardest thing for him to release. So what is it that you're in need of? He freely will give you all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect or chosen? It is God who justifies. God has justified us through the shed blood of Jesus. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. You see that? 
Not only the Spirit makes intercession, but Jesus does. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Who shall separate us from the love? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword does not separate us from the love of Christ. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. See, these are passages that we're uncomfortable with reading. But we've got to read the full counsel of the Lord. Yet, in the middle of all the suffering, in the middle of tribulation or distress or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. See, this is the eternal perspective. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the eternal perspective. Isn't that a wonderful reality? So don't get hardened. Don't be dismayed. Don't be overcome. Do not allow your hearts to be fearful. Do not allow yourself to succumb, to yield to the fears and the sufferings of the age. Rather, embrace eternity. Stamp it on your eyes. Understand that the Spirit is interceding for you. Understand that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father making intercession. Understand that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Understand that you are, that he foreknew you, he predetermined you, he called you, he justified you, and he is glorifying you. Understand that all things are working together for a major plan of the ages. And understand that the world itself, the creation itself, is groaning and travailing for the manifestation of the sons of God. There is coming a time where eternity will swallow corruptibility. There is coming a time where evil will flee and the kingdom will shall arise in fullness and in full measure. The parallel of eternity is running on this side of life. Allow the Holy Spirit to give you an eternal perspective so that your faith grows strong, your hope grows strong, and your love goes strong. Amen. Amen. So when you see tribulation, when you see distress, when you see all of these things, look up, rejoice, for your redemption draws near, closer than you believed. Do not allow yourself 
to be swayed. Take your authority over the enemy and keep your eyes on eternity. Amen. This is Chris Garcia here. Welcome to Fresh Oil every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7 a.m. Central Standard Time. We spend time with the presence of God. If you want to grow in your relationship with the Holy Spirit, if you want to grow in getting closer to God in prayer and seeking His presence and adoration and giving glory to His name, I encourage you to check us out. This is the channel for you. We spend time together as a community and we seek God together. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 7 a.m. Central Standard Time. Join us for fresh oil. I hope to see you there. God bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.